Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Brian Gorman. He has this little thing on LinkedIn. He says, the great resignation or the great attraction. I work with leaders to leverage the forces driving the future of work to achieve success on your terms. Now, he's a vice president of Quantuvos, and of program development. He's a founder and principal at Transforming Lives. You are the hero. I am your Sherpa. And he graduated from the University of Texas at San Antonio with a master's degree in higher education and education administration, which is really cool because it, it really speaks to how we learn and how he can help us learn. Brian, glad to have you here. Zen, it's a pleasure. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I, I hope that did you justice. I know you're much more than that. <laughs> to whittle it down to just a few sentences is, you know, painstaking. So as you, you know, you've had a, a really rich life and had to have begun when you were younger with things that you became aware of. Maybe it was a voice, a, a, an intuitive notion, something like that. What was it that got you interested in your own inner development and your connection to life as it is? I think looking back, it was intuitive. Um, there was a, a path that I really started following my freshman year in college that took me about 20 years to mm. identify. Uh, <clears throat> my freshman year, uh, as I tell it in, in the, the TEDx I did back in 2020, uh, I, I grew up in a suburb of New York City, 100% Caucasian. Um, I was an introvert. I was also an Eagle Scout. Hmm. So when I got to Syracuse, I did what any introverted Eagle Scout would do, and I joined a fraternity. But I joined Alpha Phi Omega, which is the National Service Fraternity. And well, you were at least uh, in the right frame, right? Absolutely. I volunteered to help establish a Boy Scout troop on the Onondaga Reservation outside of Syracuse. And there were a few things that I learned very quickly. One, the kids didn't need a Boy Scout troop, but they did need someplace that they were able to uh, congregate, especially during the, the winter. And we were able to provide that. I also began to learn some things culturally about uh, the Iroquois and, and the Onondaga mm -hmm. nation in particular. And I learned that the university's portrayal of their mascot, which was a Native American, was racist and xenophobic. And so that freshman year, I began to try to work with the university to get them to change the mascot. It was a bit of a voice crying in the wilderness, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it took the Onondaga Nation about 10 years to get that change uh, through the university system. But that effort really sparked this thing inside of me. I the way I describe it now is I have change in my DNA. Hmm. And like for, Bruce Lipton says, right, that we actually can do that by how we think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But for the next 20 years, every challenge I took on was a, a, a change challenge, whether it was at that social level, whether it was at an organizational level, if you will, um, mm -hmm or whether it was personal. And then I discovered that that was in fact the voice inside me, um, which is about guiding myself, guiding others through what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. Excellent series with uh, Bill Moyers as well. I had a uh, oh, fascinating individual and, and full of wisdom and, and really spoke to me and, and my own journey as well as it did many others I'm sure it is at the heart of the work that I still do today 
uh, to paraphrase uh, Campbell, while we approach every change as if it's unique and unpredictable, it's not. We're taking the same journey over and over and over again. Right. It's a process, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yep. So in the in the twenty years, there's and, and I, I understand the slowness. You know, I, I feel <laughs> I feel your brother. <laughs> Um, it's as though we were from other, uh, you know, brothers from other's mothers. In that process, what were the kinds of things that you noticed early on, kind of the baby steps of the process, if you will, of things that began to shift in you, awareness that you began to develop and how that then got you looking at life a little differently? Um that's a good question. I, I I think what I noticed was, first of all, the differences. I got drafted out of graduate school. I ended up as a drill sergeant in the Air Force, um, basic training instructor, and was based on on the Air Force's definition, very successful. Mm -hmm but also based on my definition, very successful, because as award-winning as the groups of trainees that I had were, I was also labeled a bit of a miscreant because I didn't keep my hair cut short enough, I didn't shine my shoes well enough, uh, so forth and so on. And uh, you kind of hedge the edge of the boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And then I would go in on Saturdays and teach visioning to the basic trainees. Mm. Uh, now that's unique. Uh, well, I, again, we're 1972 to 76. Um, it's, yes, I earned a master's in higher ed during that period, but I also earned a master's in human relations from the University yeah, of Oklahoma. You turned around and, and applied that in, in and I think as an educator as well, our best uh, according to Bloom, right, and, and the taxonomy, the best thing we can do is get them to self-analyze and, and self-evaluate. And Absolutely. so that process of visioning really gets kids to look inside and figure out they kind of at least begin to, you know, who they might be and or who they want to be and ways of which to do that. Yeah. And especially in the military, then you want to be your best because you don't want to get yanked out of line by the drill sergeant <laughs> well and the other <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing uh, you know it's interesting um i went back to work at syracuse university after that and um, actually got into a rather heated debate with a sociology professor because one of the things that i also transmitted to my trainees is you always have choice you well, always have choice and we often think of choices between good and bad, and sometimes, no, it's between good and better, or it's right. between bad and really bad. Well, it um, depends, you know, as, as you know, and maybe you can validate this as well, because we have that choice, it depends on where we're at emotionally as to how we make those choices and what choices we make. If we feel fearful and disrespected or diminished or... or you know, we're going to make those choices because we were defensive and we're wanting to avoid something that we ultimately attract because of that. Then there's the other side of the coin where, okay, this has happened. What do I want? How do I want to create my next experience coming out of this so that I can shift away from that and not get caught in that quagmire? Because it, <laughs> it's not comfortable right? And neither is change in going to something new when you're used to that kind of environment. And I'm sure that's, how did you deal with that? Because I know with the instruction that you were doing, you had to run into that with kids and maybe even yourself too. Absolutely. Um, again, something I learned much, much later in life is how much data we receive versus how much data we process. Hmm. And that really depends on what 
we allow as filters for that data. And, and so, again, somewhat intuitively, I think, I've learned pretty early on that there are circumstances in my life I can't control. And I have a lot of control about how I respond to them. Absolutely. And I think actually, Zen, that first came to me from my grandfather teaching me how to play pinochle when there was a single digit in my age. And I used to get really grumpy when I got a bad hand. Mm -hmm. And grandpa would say, you can't determine the hand you're dealt. It's always up to you how to play it. And, and that was an unconscious filter for me, uh, even, you know, in those, uh, air force days and, and, uh, at other dark times in my life. In those dark times, because it, it, this is part of why I'm uh, doing what I'm doing is so we can share how we got through those and, and reflect on them and give other people opportunities and, and uh, maybe even some corroboration in their own process and how that it's okay to feel that way and, and you'll get through it too, you know, because we did and there are processes to do so. So in that, um, when you're, when you're dealing with the kids, how, what were some of the things, you, you know, your grandfather's wisdom was impeccable. It's just that, you know, it's like my dad told me one time, I think I was 14, and he says, you know, my dad got a heck of a lot smarter from the time I was 18 to the time I was 30. <laughs> it didn't dawn on me that, that, that what he meant, but <laughs> as we grow, we begin to recognize, oh yeah, the, the people actually do know more than I do. <laughs> and, and this is a common thing about teenagers, I think. we, Especially with all the information, the data that we're speaking of, the data onslaught that we have now just with asking questions and Googling things randomly and all that information processing that we have. How do you think that that can assist one who's in the throes of their own questioning and transformation in, in that place of not knowing what to do and, and seeking solace? I don't think you find the answer with Google or AI chat. Um, our answers are inside of us. Hmm. And um, I, I really then had, I, I think, three identifiable significant dark times in my life. Um, the first of them was when I was 31. And I finally sat down one night in my home office and I was married, didn't have children, we were, had been married for about nine years. And I said, Either I have to find a way of disconnecting myself from who I truly am, or it's time to come out of the closet. And there was no question what that answer was. Mm. There was no question that you can't disconnect from who you are. Exactly. I, I was not about to give up my identity, my soul. Mm-hmm. Really? Although many people, and this is what's so strange, how people perceive and look at and expect others to fit in their worldview. And if they don't, then there's something wrong with them. And that's absolutely ridiculous. It just means you can't see, you know, you're in that, it's like the visible light spectrum, <laughs> right? We, we see less than 1% of that and yet we want to project that we know what the other looks like well we don't what you said about the inner yeah. connection the voice that whether it's a voice and a prompting and intuition those answers you ask the questions when you learn how to shut up afterwards <laughs> did you how did you find that out right how, when did you stop trying to answer the questions with what you thought you knew 
I think that probably was the first time that in, in that, that period of coming to accept who I am and stop running away from it. Mm -hmm. Um, it was the first time that I really spent a lot of time with myself and not expecting that my life experience can be fulfilled from the outside. Um, and a piece of that, one of the catalysts really was that, um, I was working at Syracuse university now. I'm, I'm back out of, out of the service. Um, and I was fundraising and we would set up in the lobby of the field house where the bas basketball games were played. And I would see couples coming in like zombies. And then they would get into the basketball arena, the games would start and there would be all of this excitement and energy and then the games would end and the zombies would leave and i realized that was how i was living my life and that wasn't who i am mm. i could feel that this is not who i am this is not how life is meant to be lived well that's a profound observation at any age and and so i think that's where uh, reflection really mm -hmm. started to become an important practice for me. Um, we can fast forward to uh, 2004. So now I am 54. And um, I was in a failing relationship, um, had started a photography business and had a, uh, on my first commercial shoot, a model agency walk away with $20,000 that was owed to the models. Um, life was feeling meaningless in a lot of ways, because I had been working for four years to, uh, to launch this photo business and literally twice in two days, I almost ended my life. And, um, between those two events, I had met with my therapist and as I was putting things in place that second day, he called to check up on me and literally talked me out of the apartment and to the emergency room. Mm. A bit of where, an intuitive himself too. Hmm? Yeah. And I admitted myself to the psychiatric ward. I was there for two weeks. And again, um, I was in a relationship with, with someone, one of our dear friends uh, said to me before she passed away, she said, you know, he's never going to accept the fact that he's gay hmm. and and uh, and that was obvious that was so obvious and and yet i still tried to make things work and um so when i admitted myself it was really again a time of deep reflection mm -hmm. of am i going to because i went into that relationship and and move through that relationship unless something really really mattered to me it was like we'll have it your way we'll we'll do it your way sure you can make that decision that's okay and i realized i had given away all of me mm -hmm. and well and relationship is about um being able to navigate negotiate and you know give in to others and, and be part of that uh, and yet i totally understand what you're saying because there is a point where especially as a giver there's a that an obvious sign in the relationship where that giving 
where you find out it's not really being received as giving it, it's being received as an expectation yeah and and so i really at that time decided that i didn't want to end my life i did want to live fully and fully and fullier if that's a word <laughs> it um, <is> now. <laughs> into who i am and to really spend more time discovering who i am and living that life and just to end this piece of the story um, the first time he came to visit me in my new apartment he literally wasn't six feet inside the door and he said i feel like i'm on vacation there's such peace here and i took that all away from you and i looked at him and i said I gave it away to you. Yeah, it was a conscious choice. And, and yet the acknowledgement that he had, that must have been just amazing to have that recognition. And I'm guessing it was without prompt. Absolutely without prompt. Yeah. So that's um, a huge I, growth. It didn't last. <laughs> <laughs> well you know at least there was that recognition yeah that again yeah. you know people it's really difficult unless there's someone holding your hand through the entire change process whatever that is that's you know right there with you we snap back to old habits because the neurocircuitry the neuro pathways are already there and we haven't created new pathways to to follow yeah or, it's and that's a tough one to do to do and yet it can be done you're living proof the the third dark night if you will mm -hmm. happened just two years later um i i had been now working uh, very successfully as a uh, change management consultant for a very homophobic homophobic boss um he didn't necessarily hire me, but yeah, he, what a setup. He oversaw my work <laughs> and literally uh, called me one Sunday night as I was driving home from a birthday birthday dinner with my sister. And he said, Don't bother coming to the client tomorrow. They don't want you there. I said, What should I do? He said, Wait at home and we'll call you. Well, the client called me the next day and said, where are you? So I knew there was something else going on. It took two weeks before I got a phone call uh, from him and the managing partner of the company. And basically they said, you're fired. Um, again, now I'm 56 years old and um quickly discovered that at 56 it's going to be hard to find employment mm. and so that was what set me out on the path to being out on my own of um, course right uh, like, yeah. it's, I it's like I, I i can't find a job i need to find work and um again that was but the the chairman of that company that partnership um who i had known and and worked for um in the past said to me this is a moment it is not every moment Mm. and there will be other moments there will be different moments and that i think was a, a critical message for me and again realizing i could continue to filter my experience through that termination experience mm -hmm. um and it's so tempting it's so tempting to do so right yeah it yeah. just feels so good to just get inside and get all gnarly and and yet 
what's the you know the ultimate effect of that what are you doing to yourself by that and there's and yeah. what opportunities are you shutting off right by being that person by sending out that energy yeah universe can't get through a block um so here i am i am the happiest i have been in my life i'm 73 year old 73 years old how about young i, I am <laughs> excited to get up and come to work every morning because the work I do makes my heart sing and that's the most important thing that we uh, why do you think that and maybe even how might you presume others to feel I, I realize we can't speak for how others feel we can't understand how they think just by their behavior how do you think that this may um this shift this understanding and, and uh, acknowledgement of this moment being something that can either expand or contract and it's up to you as to which it's going to do how do you think others can relate to that because in that process uh, we're not really open right we hear those things but yet because we're in that emotional quagmire we're not really listening deeply let alone connecting with what that means until we begin to either cool off or, or you know some time has passed and we reflect if we reflect um, how might you suggest would be a good way that others in those situations might be able to just consider that moment and reflect on it in, in a different way what are the kinds of thoughts or questions that can others ask themselves answers being within right that would prompt those answers that are most appropriate in their development of their own self-love we had story before we had words mm. we drew story in the dirt on hides on cave walls our brain is a story processor mm -hmm. change your story and you change your life so what is the story i'm telling me about this experience how else might i tell this story that story of being a victim of a homophobic boss can be true and i can sit as that victim but also true was the door that opened for me to develop a whole new set of skills around curricular design hmm. um, in the fields of work that I have been doing and then to move into the world of coaching which is what I've been preparing my whole life to do and had you not had the dark moments you wouldn't have developed the skill set that you have in order to assist others who are going through the similar things and it's you know praiseworthy that not that we have to go through all of that however it's praiseworthy that we step up and, and do go through it and then turn and help others that are in similar situations absolutely we are what do you feel about the state of love in the world do we even talk about it you know we've had i've had some organizational development conversations and, and within companies and you know loves like the nasty word that you bring that in and everybody goes oh, oh this is a weird guy or whatever, <laughs> you know um and yet you know that basic nature that we all have and i think you'll agree on this is to love and be loved right this is what we seek in everything we do and who we are like you had mentioned you know you had to get out of your projected self from others and into your natural self 
from within. Yeah. I had the most amazing surprise experience last week. Hmm. Uh, it was a, a two day workshop with 15 senior executives of a global company. New leader, um, a lot of shuffling of uh, roles and responsibilities, um, a lot of what we always see in terms of let me claim my territory and mm -hmm. if that means stepping on you, sorry, but. And the anxiety that just, you could cut it with a knife. Um, sure. So all of that was going on and, and um, worked actually with a leadership development specialist in, in putting the, the two days together. Mm -hmm. um, they began by looking at sort of what they what they're getting right and then what the reality is of their relationships with one another mm -hmm. um, that afternoon i moved them into looking at the different elements of judith glasser's trust model and the model is trust i did not use the word trust with them because their HR person told me, you'll just send them running. Oh, yeah, it's like talking about love. So um, we talked about transparency and mm -hmm. did an exercise to begin to build some transparency, relationship, understanding, shared success, and truth-telling. And each of these exercises took them a bit deeper into relationship with one another. And then we had told them at lunch, we were doing an exercise during cocktail hour and a half a dozen of them said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And the exercise was take three minutes to share a story about a success you've had or a time in your life that you've shown up at your best. Nobody did it in three minutes. We were supposed to sit down to dinner at 6.30. At 7.30, the maitre d' said, I can't keep the kitchen staff here all night. Please sit down. People were laughing and crying over the stories that other people were telling. We were at the dining room table for from 7.30 until after 10. The next morning we came in and started debriefing and um, one of the men, most of them were men, one of the men turned to the other, to another and said, you know, I really do love you. So long story, but true story. Um, I think love is is real. Mm. I think I think we do crave it, and I think that there are ways to foster it in our relationships, in the workplace, as as well as in our our personal lives. Um, as long as we understand that. You know, it takes many flavors. And time. And, and time. And time. I had um, a similar, I, I was in the aerospace industry in my 20s and, and was kind of a whiz kid. I got promoted into the production control department. I was in charge of $7 million a month in shipments, 800 part numbers, commercial spare parts. And because of how I operated, I ended up at the top of the list in a 35 person department, not aware of it until a couple of supervisors come to my cubicle one day and I'm thinking, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> and they saw the look on my face is no, 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 we're, we want to know what you're doing. And, you know, the bottom line, it, it was, I was living the golden rule. I was doing to others how I wanted to do it to me. And so 
in, in doing that, I would help people, you know, I, I had full run of the plant. I, I knew some of the areas of people that had to desk jobs, they couldn't get up and walk around, or, or if they did, it took time away from other things. So I offered to help and, and I'm going places doing stuff. Why not? And I got really great responses in anything that I needed by so doing. Mm -hmm. And because of this company being a mainly defense contractor, their management structure was command and control. And so people would beat people up to get what they want if they couldn't get it. And that, that would be emotionally and, and they would sabotage people and, and just all kinds of, of junk, right? So what eventually happened was I raised my hand in a departmental meeting and suggested having interpersonal skills classes in the department. Of course, that made me the uh, outlier for about two weeks. Nobody talked to me. A year later, um, I was talking with a general supervisor after a meeting that I, the notice for it had been taken off my desk, so I'd missed it. And I apologized. He said, you know what you're doing. And, you know, and then we offered or we asked for suggestions. And I said, I still think interpersonal skills would behoove the department because it doesn't matter what the product is. It's people that get the job done. And he says, you know, you're right. Do you know of anybody? I was finishing my bachelor's degree at University of Phoenix at the time. And I thought, yeah, I didn't. <laughs> I went out and I, I made a bunch of phone calls. And I found somebody, brought him in. Three weeks later, we had a meeting. And then uh, three weeks after that, I was demoted. Same week, my divorce was final. And it was just devastating to me. Now, a year and a half later, I, I, left, I left the company shortly thereafter. And a year and a half later, I ran into the purchasing department secretary who had her desk right outside my cubicle. And we had become good friends. And she said, you know, they have instituted interpersonal skills classes plant-wide. And I'm like, thank God, right? They finally did it. And this was the beginning of the development of like Senge's work and, and mm -hmm. uh, the you know self mastery and learning organization and it eventually evolved into emotional intelligence which is where the love vibe can now enter in because we can talk in that language how yeah. do you use that emotional intelligence language in the work that you're doing because I'm, I'm sure that that's got a lot to do with it and what are the benefits that you've noticed with it Um, the the first piece of my answer there, Zen, is my undergraduate degree is cultural anthropology. I observe. Mm. If I can observe directly how is a leader interacting with those that are leading, um, or those they're supposed to be leading right. <laughs> because some may choose not to follow. Uh, and there's um, formal and informal as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and informal leaders are typically emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. They may not recognize it. They may not use it in the healthiest ways, but they have it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if I'm can observe or on top of the observation, I'm a coach. I ask questions. I'm curious. So help me understand, um, the kinds of questions you ask before you hire somebody. That's going to tell me a lot about your understanding of people and relationship and motivation and engagement and um and creating and, culture and creating culture yeah are are you hiring another cog to replace the one that left or that you fired or are you hiring people mm -hmm. um i'm curious tell me about why you handled that situation that way um so I really use my coaching, if you will, to explore and, and help foster growth in emotional intelligence.
that's really a, a, a wise aspect of coaching, right? To be able to, to use it in that way. I was interviewed about uh, my best advice for upcoming life coaches, right? <clears throat> the, the young ones that are getting certified and things like that. And my initial response was have a life first. Because if you don't have the life, you're not going to develop. You may have the, the emotional intelligence. That's rare. That usually takes decades to really fully develop and, and be useful because there are so many nuances in it. And so it's difficult to, to use that. But what you're doing in, in that, how are you... Um, what advantages do you notice that those that you get them to dig deeper and ask questions about themselves? That's how we grow. That's how we grow. My job as a coach is not to help you become somebody else, not to help you become mm -hmm. someone I think you should become. It's to help you know yourself more fully and to grow more fully into who you are meant to be. Now that brings up a question that I would just love to ask and, and get your opinion on. <clears throat> Knowing the, the cultural anthropology that you do, the structure, the being, the evolution of the genome, do you feel that the possibility of a perfected form fit and function in the world that aligns the genetic code and the, the frequency that we have, I, I want to call it a solar frequency, I'm not sure if that's the appropriate word or not, but we each have a distinct frequency that can be measured, and then we have that genetic code that's embedded as well. How do those things merge, in your opinion, and, and do they merge into an awareness of a perfected form, fit, and function in the world for us? Is that possible? I don't know. Um, I think it's possible to continue moving closer to. Mm -hmm. The word that I shy away from is perfected. And I know that that's a, by perfected, let me reframe that so that it's not quite so charge filled. Um, let's just use a natural, because to me, you know, the, all of this stuff that we're doing is unnatural to our own human nature. And yet we're being told that, oh, this is just human nature. I, I don't buy that. I think our nature is to love and be loved and to attempt to ascend to that place where we are, like we were talking about the Vedantic philosophy earlier that were divine threads incarnate and aware of that and that would seem to make a much better behavioral pool right um so do you if that's possible even just moving the needle a little bit towards that how do you see that being accelerated or even um promoted in the current organizational themes today i think COVID did us a big favor in that regard um i see COVID as a catalyst robert uh, gilman would agree with you on that um and and it's really been a catalyst for changes that have been bubbling beneath the surface for the most part mm -hmm. uh, for decades and so my own uh, projection, if you will, into the future is that we really are at that, moving toward that tipping point, very similar to the tipping point that brought us into the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and that we will be seeing the most significant shift in the nature of work in the workplace and the work experience uh the most significant shift in all of that that we have seen since the start of the industrial revolution mm -hmm. and 
some of those shifts <clears throat> are about just what you're talking about. It's about, I do work that has purpose. Not I do work. Mm -hmm. It's about work is a part of my life, not work is my life. It's about that person I'm working for, he isn't my boss. He's my coach. He's my go-to to help me develop and grow. She's my nurturer in the workplace. Um, so I think that we are at, at the cusp of moving into a much more for lack of a better term, uh, humane work experience. Mm. Much All more science. I'm sorry, go ahead. Much more loving work experience and lovable. I had really surprised, and I don't want to say surprised, I, I'm enriched by seeing the shift. And I agree with you, COVID had a silver lining and that was getting people that, you know, obsessive on self hygiene and, sequ and sequestrated. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to talk to yourself. Well, how, what are you going to talk to yourself about? Well, maybe you're going to look inside and figure out who you really are because you haven't had time to do so. And now you're being forced because you're sitting quietly with nothing else to do except binge watch and or binge watch. And that gets old after a while. Right? <laughs> There's still those moments of, oh my God, what am I going to do? Right. And they may be fleeting, but they're sprinkled throughout there what I saw happen was that these people who were maybe already waiting and they'd advanced and, and you know, COVID really didn't take a hold of them, but they reached out to seek others that didn't, that it didn't get a hold of either. And these groups started forming and these conversations started happening and new companies started evolving and, you know, the workplace shift began happening and, and, you know, and now what is it just, um, I'm not sure how long ago it happened, but the SEC and the FTC announced a new company category and that's natural asset companies. And they're predicting that that is going to far exceed any GNP that's been around for hundred years or so, even the you know, I think, what is it now, we're gross, or, or the global GNP is about 400 billion or something like that. And they're expecting that this to exponentiate the, the natural asset companies. Why? Because they're finally turning and facing, taking care of humans and the planet. And the shift from people in, or profit over people and planet is shifting now to plant, people and planet over profit. Now, how do we, how do you see this work that you're doing, helping to facilitate that and, and the leadership that you're involved with and how that's trickling out into the organization? So what, what kind of evidence are you seeing of this um, upwising? I think it's showing up in a few ways. Um, <clears throat> The leaders that I'm working with are much more intentional about how much time they're spending at work. That's just just as one example. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, at, at a group of uh, very high leaders in another organization, one of them stood up and he said, do you think anybody who works for us is looking up at us and saying, if I bust my butt for the next 20 years, I too can be working seven days a week. Hmm. And this organization, part of the culture shift that these leaders are driving is a much more balanced relationship um, and, and even a more blended relationship between work and the rest of their lives. Hmm. And, and balance is all important. And, and many of them are looking at how do I spend that time? Some of it's with family. 
some of it's in, in, involved in those those community kinds of activities, those social kinds of activities, those environmental kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. So again, I you know another outcome of the that COVID catalyst is I think we are going to see greater investment in community. We've been missing it for far too long. And, and it would seem that the chaos we experienced is evolving to a new order. And that new order includes this harmony kind of sense that we're at least attempting to figure out how to acquiesce to, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't push it, you can't pull it. You have to acquiesce to it and, and do the things that are necessary for it to become present. Now, speaking of presence and the precious present, do you notice that in times of greater harmony in work groups that more gets done in less time? So funny you should ask that. I actually am the co-holder of a trademark on four day work week. Ah, so you do. And it's a metaphor as we use it. Sure. Uh, my, my partner, Tony Carnese in that endeavor and I, um, what it means is exactly that. When we have the right environment, we can get the same amount of work done in less time. Mm. So would that mean that time then is more a measurement of the change of entropy? I don't know. I haven't thought about that one. <laughs> right, I know. Well, I, I just kind of threw that in. And, and I read that in uh, memoirs of a guy that ran Canada's UFO investigation program in the 1950s. And it came from a conversation he'd had with people from elsewhere. And those do happen. And one of the things that they said to him was that humans don't understand the concept of time as they do, and it is a measurement of the change of entropy. So when things automatically, it would seem, you know, deductive logic, when you experience greater harmony, there's less disturbance, which means you don't have to weed through as much in order to get the stuff done. And it can be a visceral experience, kind of like Michele, uh, she sent me Haley in flow the psychology of optimal right. experience expresses right it's like a jazz and, and as a progressive drummer myself jam sessions man you lose yourself right <laughs> it's just everybody climbs in you go off and it's like what happened to time you know um so these kinds of things can actually be present in a workplace and happy people do get more done with less supervision and will far exceed your expectations when given the proper tools and training I uh, <clears throat> mentioned earlier, coaching makes my heart sing. Mm. That question is one that I will often ask my clients. What makes your heart sing? What are you doing when you're in that zone where the world disappears, time disappears, everything disappears except what you're doing? Um, you know, I'm working on a, a project now that I've been trying to fit in between all the other appointments. And uh, just before we got on, I, I had a, a meeting and somebody asked me how my day was going. I said, I had two hours to sit and write a guide. And it was like, flow, flow. You know, I didn't get it all done, but what a productive two hours mm -hmm. so yeah now what are the keys to to be able to experience that that you've found and that might be easy triggers or that may not be the best words, <laughs> but, <laughs> that, that are easier considerations for experiencing time in, in a way that's more fashionable right? It, it loves fashionable, right? So 
and that's when you're in that place when you love what you're doing you're you're fully expressing and time disappears how does that how can how can we help support that with others and with ourselves um a couple of things that a couple of tools that i use and and i use with my clients um, one is the uh, often attributed to covey i've seen it attributed to eisenhower as well sort of the two by two urgent and important matrix right and we tend to drive the important lane on the highway or i'm sorry we tend to drive the urgent lane on the highway and a lot of what we focus on as urgent has nothing to do with being important or important to us mm -hmm. but we do hover quite a bit oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah so it's been on the hov lane right be intentional about driving that important lane and that that important lane is really about what's important to you because if the jobs you're do job you're doing is not important to you get another freaking job right. right um and yes you're not always going to be happy but if you're not happy most of the time you're not doing something right you're doing something wrong yeah <laughs> so so really learning to drive the important lane and then making time to stay in that important lane i don't talk about time management i talk about priority management we all have the same amount of time am i going to prior prioritize it doing stuff that makes other people happy or am i going to prioritize it doing stuff that fulfills me and my purpose for being here mm -hmm. Now that and oh, by the way, some of that may make other people happy, and that's oh, great. absolutely. I was going to say, you know, that, that could sound rather selfish. However, the process of self love is selflessly selfishness or being selfishly selfless. And in that, do you find that there's a, a new energy present, that there's this um, almost an experience of awe? when you're in that place where not only what you prioritize is important that it also works for others simultaneously as though you're in a symbiosis right which we generally are not and we don't realize it that's where things really begin to <laughs> shake rattle and hum right uh, yeah. in a good way uh, how do you how can we facilitate that to a greater degree you know as as a coach you've got great questions in those questions what are some of the potential answers that folks don't always consider or take a while to do so and miss a lot in the process we don't have enough time <laughs> <laughs> which is why the questions become so important absolutely and, and why the reflection becomes so important um just for those who are not familiar with coaching or uh the way effective coaching works ask one question at a time mm -hmm don't ask yes no questions don't ask questions for which you know the answer and once you've asked the question shut up the key. <laughs> let your client reflect on what you're asking let them discover within themselves what that answer is and give them the space to do so and give them the space to do so do you find that in that process early on it may not have been that way highly intuitive and sensitive people can often empathize with others and, and almost feel the answer as it's 
becoming present in the client, right? Or, or maybe even just slightly before <laughs> because you've been down that road already. Um, do you notice that kind of connectivity with clients and, and their willingness to then take that to a, a new level of vulnerability in sharing what's going on inside of them? Absolutely. I mean, you need to start with establishing a trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but part of what you're talking about now is really the neuroscience behind coaching and behind intuition. Mm -hmm. And um, I will actually often introduce this to my clients because uh, particularly corporate leaders think that you need to be rational about everything. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Well, rational thinking happens up in our head, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? In your heart, you have the same motor neurons and sensory neurons as you have in your head. And in your gut as well. Which... And in your gut as well. And you learned that from the Iroquois. <laughs> I didn't learn it as neuroscience. I did mm -hmm. learn it. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, we have different ways of explaining stuff, but, yeah. and when I found out about it, it was presented to me as the ancient indigenous philosophy of, of the three brain system, the gut, the heart, and the head, and the first brain being the gut, because why? Because we're sensitive to all the vibrations. What's creation? We're, uh, it's all vibrations. Gosh, you know, and yes, we can think. But how do we process and do we process it effectively? Do we, you know, feel what's going on around us and then say, oh, is it desirable or undesirable? It's a hard process, right? And then making the choices with the brain. Yeah. That's the most effective way. And, as, and this obviously is what you're talking about as well. I'm just explaining it a little bit differently. And, Absolutely. I, like it, right? <laughs> um, I, I often teach coaching skills and in that teaching do a lot of demonstration mm. and um it was actually earlier this week uh, in a class and somebody asked me why did you do it that way and it, it, it was a particular coaching technique that can be applied a couple of different ways and i said gut instinct mm -hmm. I usually do it this different way. And something told me that this time, this was the way to go. Um, so learning to listen to your gut, learning to listen to your heart, um, the communication between those three brains is predominantly upward. Yes. By far upward. And so keeping that pathway open. I have one client who is, um, has Asperger's and he will actually have conversations with him himself. Mm. Uh, heart, what do you say about this? Gut, shut up. This is a heart and head decision. <laughs> and, you know, and we think that's so silly. And yet, my gosh, we, you know, our bodies are transceivers. We, we tend to, because we're intellectual, we're thinkers, we're thetonic, a Greek word, thetan, T-H-E-T-A-N, which is where we get our this first reference in the dictionary as to where we get our name or word Satan from, oddly enough. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? We're, we're just thinking and we're shoving stuff down through our body instead of responding to that process that's coming up and giving us all this information that we can then process and make choices as of and with that is far better yeah but it's weird right because we tend to feel those little subtle sensations and dismiss them immediately we call it second guessing yep right because we want to shove our head into it <laughs> So how do we not shove our head into it? How do we plug our, how do we pull our, here's a good question. And, and I, without, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. <laughs> <How do> we... 
And I want to hear how you express this. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you know where I'm going. How, how do we do that? What's your advice as to the first things one can do to become aware, first of all, and then a first choice or a first response to that awareness? Breathe. Breathing and there are different patterns of breath work. Mm -hmm. um, but any breath work that allows us to center ourselves. Right. So you align. don't necessarily do a fire breath in the midst of a organizational <laughs> meeting, right? No, no. But but <laughs> to align our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems to open ourselves up to hearing, feeling um receiving whatever you want to say mm -hmm. the message from our gut the message from our heart as well as the message from our head and with practice you don't need five minutes of centering breath you can, you can do it in five seconds mm -hmm. I found something when, when I was uh, a teenager and, you know, back in the seventies, there was a lot of experimentation going on. And one night I was in one of those experimental situations and I was just kind of not sure what to do. And I found that I, my fingertips were pressed together. And for some reason, I felt my heart beat in my fingertips and it totally distracted me from the chaos that I was in in my head. And I started paying attention to it because it was felt really cool. And then I just started feeling it and breathing and all my angst disappeared. And so now <laughs> it's a really easy process, right? That anybody can do anywhere in that time. Hit the pause button, put your fingertips together, take a few breaths, feel your heartbeat, and you're good to go. Because you've just exited your head into your feeling. Just change the filters. Yeah. Yeah. It's phenomenal as to what things, just little techniques, everybody's got their own. Right. And, and yeah. you shared some and, and, you know, I've got my own and those may work for some may not. How, what would you suggest would be a, a good question for listeners to ask themselves as far as where they want to go with themselves and the growth that they want to have in creating a better life coming out of this situation we're in now because we're still in process and, and <laughs> there's I'll, much I'll, more to come unfortunately i'll go back to my question what makes your heart sing wonderful how can you learn to sing along not can you but how can you right That's a perfect, how can you sing along? Awesome. Brian, this has been such a wonderful conversation. The wisdom you've shared, the vulnerability that you had in sharing the things that, in your life. I really appreciate that. And it shows the strength of character that you have and, and the, the centeredness that you are and your ability to, to step up and help others as well. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. It's been a real honor. Zen, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity. Thank you. You're very welcome. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us through this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I'll see you next time.